Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, our weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives. Debts, jobs, incomes, all of that. For ourselves, for our children, for the coming generations. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and I hope it has prepared me to offer you these economic updates. I want to begin with the defense budget and the story it tells us. President Trump announced early in December that he wanted to do something about the ballooning deficit, the result of the tax cuts he passed last December, by cutting back government budgets for the different agencies, including the Defense Department. He proposed a very modest decrease for the Defense Department, for the upcoming fiscal year, the one that runs from 2019 to 2020. He wanted to cut it from $716 billion to $700 billion. He even referred to the request for 716 initially made as quote unquote crazy in one of his tweets. Very quickly, the generals sprang into action led by General Mattis at the Defense Department. They quickly organized a luncheon with General Mattis, probably involving General Kelly, and involving the head of the Republican-dominated House, still for the rest of this year, and the Republican-dominated Senate. They all got together and had a lunch with President Trump, after which, full of smiles, they announced that the new figure for the defense budget would not be the $700 billion that Mr. Trump had originally suggested, would not be the $716 billion that had been initially proposed. It wouldn't even be the $733 billion that the military had said was the absolute minimum they could live with. No, it's going to be $750 billion given to the Defense Department. Well, I'm struck by that, and I have only really one comment. Mr. Trump, who promised to be different from other politicians, is here doing what all other politicians have in fact done, namely give the government, and particularly the military, pretty much what it wants, if not more than what it wants. Oh, not much different there. And likewise, like so many politicians and presidents before him, promising one thing and doing another. What has he done? December of 2017, he took care of the business community by cutting taxes on profits. And in December 2018, he takes care of the military, the business and the military, the military and the business. Politicians know what they have to take care of before they get to anything else. The City Council of New York did something remarkable recently. It passed a minimum wage for on-demand ride-hailing drivers, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, those folks. They hadn't been covered before. And it's a final step, in a way, of showing that that industry is exactly like the taxi industry, because that's what happened to them. They started out driving taxis 100 years ago, And they weren't very well insured, and the cars weren't very well maintained, and the workers were not properly vetted, and they weren't well paid. And the result was an inadequate, dangerous taxi service. Until, of course, the private profit hustles of all the taxi drivers led to a demand for better, safer conditions. A taxi and limousine commission was established in New York, as in so many other cities, and a deal was struck because relying on the private capitalist economy is too dangerous. Wages were set. Prices for cab drivers were set. Rules were set requiring insurance and vetting and training and maintenance of the cars, etc. All that Uber and Lyft ever were were an attempt to get around that by calling it not a taxi but a 
ride-hailing service, they could, for a few years, make a ton of money by getting around, by paying workers less, by not taking care of their cars properly, by not insuring them. The same game. And all that's happening now is, once again, we're learning the same lesson. Leaving ride-hailing services to do what we originally let the taxis do is forcing us to do what we eventually had to do to the taxis as well. All that those scams were were ways of getting around the rules to make a buck. All the talk about gig economy, sharing economy, and technological breakthrough was so much verbiage to pull a stunt to make money. Here's a little one. Party politics in a capitalist society involve promising one thing and doing something else because people kind of know. So at least you have to promise, and they can indulge the fantasy that maybe you will be different. And so it has been with Mr. Trump. He maintains a website store, Mr. Trump does, where you can buy all kinds of things that have the name Trump on them. You can go to the website, and you can order them. And there's a study that was done by the Quartz podcast and the Quartz website. 85% of the items on the Trump store are made outside the United States. 85%. Here's another quick one. Charter schools, the attempt to get around the public schools with the democratic unifying structure that they were always intended to have by taking your kid out and putting him or her in a special school just for you, or people who are like you, or people who have the same faith you do, etc., etc. Breaking down the unifying democratic impulse behind public schools, often done by people who are rightly upset with the quality of public schools. But of course, you could make the public school better, and then you'd have the best of both of these objectives. Anyway, Here's a way that charter schools are not different from public schools. They try to get away with paying teachers very little. It led to strikes earlier in 2018 across many states, how bad it was and how badly we have treated our teachers. Well, it's caught up to the charter schools as well. The Acero Charter Schools, 15 of them in the Chicago area, employing 550 teachers and staff, well, they're all went out on strike, demanding the kind of better teaching pay and staff pay in these schools, just like in the public schools. Some things don't change. Then there was a wonderful analysis in the Asia Times by one David Goldman. And it's really interesting. It it talks about the kind of absurd debate going on between the United States and China, the yelling, the threats, the counter threats, and all the rest of it. He cuts through all of that and says basically what's going on is that the United States has now figured out that the Chinese economy is as dynamic, if not more so, than the United States once was, and is not only catching up to the United States, but has already surpassed the United States in a number of areas. This is very upsetting to all kinds of people in the United States who somehow thought that unlike every other society that has ever been dominant in the world, that dominance eventually came to an end and was replaced by the dominance of another country or of another group of countries. The United States finds it difficult apparently to imagine such a thing could happen to itself. And so there's all these efforts And there'll be some posturing, and there'll be some tariffs, and there'll be some rules changes, and the Chinese will buy some more, and all of that. But it doesn't change, as Goldman nicely points out, the fact that the Chinese are spending way more money in certain advanced technological fields, and therefore making great progress relative to the United States. They invest in their universities on a massive scale at the same time that the United States is cutting back on its support for universities. So the basic change is not being affected by any of these pieces of theater. And he notes that the Chinese leadership seems to get that 
whereas the American keeps railing. Nothing illustrates that better than the recent arrest by Canadians at the request of the United States of a high official of one of the most technologically advanced companies in China. And it's part of a campaign against Huawei, the company that she's an executive of, that's getting countries around the world not to buy their high-tech telecommunications equipment for fear that the Chinese might have embedded in them somehow things that will help their security. Well, you're in a very slippery slope here. Imagine if countries around the world, fearful of what the CIA might be doing, stopped buying American high-tech goods for fear of how that might compromise their security. This is a very dangerous game to play that the United States is leading in. It could come back and backfire badly on the United States since it is now so reliant on Apple and Microsoft and all these other high-tech enterprises. Be careful what you wish for. It might come back and bite you in a very troubling place. It's also the case that if we block countries from buying the best equipment, then the best equipment made in China will be only available to the Chinese and their friends. Do we really want that advantage to be lopsidedly located because we won't buy? Very dangerous, these ideas, and probably not going to last very long. There's a quick kind of mentality here that misses the larger, deeper picture. My last update has to do with a decision by Volkswagen, one of the biggest car companies in the world, to stop the production of gas-powered cars forever. The projected date, 2026, isn't that far off, and they're already starting. And their plan is to shift entirely to electric vehicles. Now, VW is already the largest car producer in Europe and in China. This will have enormous effects since it will be followed by other companies. Think of the effects. Think of all the gas stations in the world that will now be out of business. What will happen to those parts of every community? What will happen to the people whose lives depend on them? What will happen to all of the real estate adjustments when we don't have gas-powered cars? No planning that I know of is underway to deal with this. It's just being decided by car companies based on their profits. And that really brings me to the key point. We always had a choice between individual private cars and mass transit, moving people and goods, not by one at a time, but in groups. Why would that be interesting? Well, let's go and review again. It's much cheaper to move people in a bus or a van or a train or a plane than in an individual car. It uses much less energy to pollute the universe and to use up fossil fuels. It causes much less in the way of death and injury from accident. It is much easier and cheaper to insure. I could go on. There ought to be, in any rational society, a choice human beings could make between the private car with all of its costs and public transportation with all of its savings. Suppose we all could have two hours less work a week if we used public transportation, more leisure to be with our families, to have a relationship. Those are the real choices we face. But VW doesn't want that choice. VW wants to make cars because it's profitable. And if they can't make cars using gas, they want the private car electric. Lord help us, if we actually used the end of reliance on gas because it's dangerous to move to public transportation, high quality, fast and efficient. It's cheaper, it's better, and capitalism can't accommodate it. We've come to the end of the first half of Economic Update. Thank you for being with me, and I look forward to your coming right back after a short break for a remarkable interview. Welcome back to the second half of Economic Update. 
Before jumping into our interview, I want to remind you, please, take advantage of the YouTube relationship we have. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for economic update. Likewise, make use of our website, economic, sorry, democracyatwork.info. There you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I also want to thank our Patreon community for its ongoing and enthusiastic support. Well, today I want to welcome Victor Wallace. Some of you may remember he's been on our show before. This time he comes as the author of a new book, Red Green Revolution, The Politics and Technology of Eco-Socialism, published this year by Political Animal Press in Toronto, Canada. Victor teaches political science in the liberal arts department at the Berkeley School of Music in Boston. For 20 years, he was the managing editor of the journal Socialism and Democracy. And you can find out more about Victor Wallace at his website, Victor Wallace, spelled W-A-L-L-I-S, VictorWallace.com. Thank you, Victor, for joining me again. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Okay. Let's start by making sure everyone in our audience understands what you mean by this basic term, eco-socialism. What is it? Why did you put that in the title of your book? Well, actually, the term itself has been in use for quite a while now, at least 15 years. In fact, there was an eco-socialist manifesto that was released at the World Social Forum in Brazil uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, it combines the uh, idea of ecology with that of socialism. And I argue in my book that it's, this is a very natural uh, combination in the sense that both of them clash with the idea that uh, production decisions should be made on the basis of, of profit. They both uh, adhere to the idea that decisions on what to produce, how to produce, and how much of it, and so on, uh, should be made on the basis of some uh, better criterion. And, 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 and eco calls attention to the natural environment, but the socialist criterion is uh, the, the interest of humanity. And the point is that the two are integrally connected. You, you, we can't live without the natural infrastructure. So in one sense, it's even redundant to put the eco prefix onto it because socialism implies that you make decisions on the basis of what's in the interest of people. And you can't legislate in the interest of people without taking into account the environment. However, because of the historical evolution of the awareness of these different dimensions, uh, the eco has to be added on for purposes really of emphasis to call attention to the fact that yes, definitely, this is, this is part of, uh, this is integral to, uh, to our critique of, of capitalist societies, a critique of what it's done catastrophically and is, it continues to do to the natural environment. You know, it's interesting because on our program we often talk about the bad outcomes when you allow decisions that affect everybody to be made by a very small minority in the society whose job it is in this system to maximize their profit. Right. So people who are doing their job, maximizing their profit of their business, are doing it while the social consequences, or in your case, the natural consequences, could be devastating. And that, that's, not a, that's not an intelligent way to organize human life. Right. It strikes me as, as you say, it's, a, it's an old idea, reworded, but with the same punch it always did. Right. Okay, we've had a bevy of scientific reports. As more and more people become aware of the ecological crises we're living through, the dangers to our national envi natural environment, global warming, climate change, all of it, tell me what has been the impact of recent scientific statements, studies, researches on the interest in and the importance of eco-socialism? Well, I, all it does is really confirm, underline, underscore everything that uh, uh, has been really clear for years. And the ironic thing is that it was clear even to the perpetrators of all this mischief. I mean, the petroleum companies themselves, as came out uh, not long ago, knew about this stuff back at, as early as the 1970s, if not even earlier, as it now seems to have been the case. Uh, they knew that it would cause global warming. They didn't care. They not only didn't care that this would happen, but they set out on a campaign to obfuscate the whole the whole phenomenon. So it's a it's really a, it, it has it's not just reckless homicide. It's 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 it corresponds to an actual murder. I mean of the of the of the planet. 
monetary system. I mean, it's the level of criminality of the deliberate decision to continue or, or to, uh, to initiate and continue and then hide the, uh, what they're doing uh, is uh, incalculable. Yeah. You wonder, for me, it's like the saga of the tobacco companies with cigarette smoke and knowing for years of the link between that and cancer and basically hiding it or muddying the consciousness of the people. Tell me, does it, does it build a movement for eco-socialism? Is there an awareness in the United States or abroad that this really is a system-challenging understanding that we really have to change a system that behaves so badly? Well, it, it's hard for it to develop. I mean, it, it's true that the most recent report of the Interplanetary uh, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, said that we need a new system, but it was just in very vague terms. But I mean, to actually comprehend that, and, and I think in terms of a movement for people to link that up with all the other concerns that they have, that is a task that still remains to be done. And so this denialism, it serves a real political purpose because even though the people who, who are denying what's evident before everyone's eyes, even though they may realize that they're, that they're lying, it serves a political purpose to uh, keep people in a state of confusion, keep them distracted with other things and so on. So that uh, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot to overcome. And, and in this country, it's one of the, that's one of the societies in, in which this denialism has the, the greatest impact, uh, as shown by the, f the fact that the U.S. stands almost alone. Well, and now, with, with actually with China and Saudi Arabia, the most recent uh, non-acceptance or, or, let's say, uh, failure to, to recognize and welcome the report that was presented at this current COP24 conference in Poland. Yeah, if I understand... Russia, the United States, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait, Kuwait, yeah, yeah. rejected yeah. the, yeah. You know, yeah. the yeah. four yeah. countries that are major producers and exporters of yeah. oil. Yeah. You couldn't have a starker yeah. kind of. On the one hand, the world; on the other hand, people producing. Yeah. You know, yeah. the world, which is the vast majority, and what is yeah. a tiny minority within that, mm. extraordinary that that doesn't provoke a kind of generalized horror at this situation. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're asked this all the time, but I would like to know your, your thoughts. Mr. Trump responded to that very intergovernmental report you mentioned. Mr. Trump responded, if I recall, with the words, I don't believe it, the phrase, I don't believe it, and otherwise dismissed it, ignored it, pushed it aside. How do you account for that? Why would the government do that? Well, it's, uh, let's say, the, the tip of the interest of, of capital. I mean, the, the, the capital doesn't want to make the adjustments that are required in order to address these issues. And so although many of the leading capitalists wouldn't take that kind of outlandish uh, pose, he's, he's really, he's acting. I mean, he, it, it's a saying, don't believe it. It's, uh, he'll, he'll go on saying that, but it serves a purpose, even though the people around him may know that it's not true. It, it serves a purpose. And I think one of the things that, that this is something very important brought out in Naomi Klein's book, uh, This Changes Everything. She did interviews with uh, capitalists uh, uh, who were involved in the extractive industries and so on. And she found out that they were all very well aware that a, an environmentalist uh, based agenda would really challenged the whole basis of their, of their existence. Uh, they, they didn't buy the idea that you could have uh, uh, environmentalism and that they could still go on, go on doing what they do. They understand perfectly well that it does present a systemic threat to the continuation of, of things as they are. And it, it is a question that, and this is what I argue in my book, that it, it raises the question of the whole existence of the class structure of the society, because you can have this or that progressive environmental measure, you can encourage the use of solar technology, you can put taxes here and there and so on. But if you leave in power the class that currently holds power, those measures can be revoked just as we're seeing the, the measures taken earlier, the, uh, all the uh, environmental protection measures being systematically undone by the, the present administration. And they feel under threat now. That's why there's, there's more of a, 
an acceptance of this kind of extreme response, plus the fact, you know, looking at it from the angle of, of the support, that the political support they get, you have the fact that the, uh, the other major, say, political representatives of the capital are not really willing to make any kinds of adjustments to serve the interests of, of, of the population. So there's a kind of frustration and therefore a willingness on the part of ordinary people to accept uh, outlandish statements uh, which they can sort of identify with, uh, whether it's out of vicarious envy of, of the wealth of someone like Trump or, or just whether it's uh, out of ignorance and out of a, a, a kind of frustration that their immediate needs are not being met. So, so they, they, they go for this kind of outlandish rejectionism. Do you think that the arrival of Democrats to now control the House of Representatives is that going to make a significant difference in in how the environment is dealt with? I I don't think it's going to make a, a great deal of difference. It, it might slow some of this uh, down a little bit. I mean, the the, the thing that has to be uh, kept in mind also. I mean, the the the, uh, the Democrats have, to a large extent, enabled the uh, accession of someone like Trump by their failures to do what was necessary in an earlier uh, stage. Uh, during the Obama administration or the Clinton administration. I mean, they, they often carried out policies that were similar to those of the Republicans, whether, whether it was with regard to free trade, deregulation, and so on under Clinton, or with regard to sort of waging war uh, with Obama, and, his, and even Obama uh, opening areas to, um, to, um, uh, to, to, to oil drilling, and, so, so, and uh, to fracking in particular. I mean, right. uh, that fracking is the big thing with the Democrats, with Clinton in particular, Hillary Clinton pushing for fracking. Uh, so so, so it's the the difference at the level of the party is uh, is minimal. Uh, I mean, there's sort of individuals within the Democratic Party recent uh, recently elected Congress who may make more of a protest, but that is is almost like a like a token. I mean, it, it's not going to it's not going to affect the actual policy. So I'm, I I don't think we've gone far enough yet in that direction. What is the social constituency of a movement that can make a difference? Where where would you expect? to find, if not now, then in the future, the mass interest in, support for, constituency for system change to deal with both the ecology and the class structure of capitalism. Do you see that emerging? Where would you hope to find it? Yeah. Well, it, it is a class issue. That, that has to be understood. It's, it's a class issue. The environmental issue is a class issue in the sense that uh, the capitalist class has an interest in obstructing the measures that would be necessary to protect the environment. That means that the constituency that has to contest that, to challenge it, is the working class, broadly understood. And in terms of what's actually happening in the country now, we can see, I think one of the most interesting things that has come out is that uh, many of those in key constituencies who voted for Trump had in the Democratic primary voted for Sanders, who's identified with a more progressive approach, to, especially on the, on, the, on the environmental issue to these, to these questions. So there is a potential interest, and it's just that they've been so frustrated by, uh, by the corporate Democrat leadership that they're offered uh, that they've they swung over to Trump. So the constituency there, uh, and then if you get into more specific um, dimensions or, or components of the working class. You say the, the, uh, the people of color and the s citing of, of, um, of uh, ecologically harmful uh, activities in, uh, in their neighborhoods and so on. And so environmental racism, as, as it's known, uh, this, is, this is something which is also something that can be very strongly uh, uh, spoken to as well. Victor, we've reached the end of the time. We, of course, have only scratched the surface. I want to thank you. I want to inform everyone that if you found this conversation of interest, then I hope you will join us. Patreon.com slash economic update, where we will continue this conversation on economic update extra. And for all of you, please remember, we thank you for your support and we look forward to speaking with you again next week.